Yeah. So, Mr. Bolt, uh, so um, I read uh, originally you were a jazz drummer yes. uh, and professional yes. at that, not just mucking about. No, no, no. Um, so, how did you go from bashing the skins to behind the, the lens? Well, after I came out of the army, I decided I wanted to go to America and I found out that British Airways were flying there one flight a day and you stayed there three days if you had a job you know mm -hmm. as an air steward that's what I wanted to be <laughs> and three days back in London I thought this was the ideal life for a great jazz drummer mm -hmm. so I went to BOAC and they gave me a job in the uh, well no they said you there's you've just missed the like the intake and you'll have to take a job for three months in British Airways till the next intake mm -hmm. for, to be a steward and um, I've lost my track. Yeah, so the <laughs> OAC and uh, yeah, no, and uh, so um, hang on, I've, this has never happened to me before. Uh, I've told this <laughs> story so many times in my life, <laughs> and I can't remember what I'm going to say. Anyway, I so I joined British Airways, and one of the things was they sent you to Ealing Art School one day a week to um, study, uh, for homework, you mm -hmm. know, to pick up all your techniques and all this stuff. And they gave me homework and, what, and they said, why don't I go over the airport and do a sort of Cartier-Bresson, who I had no idea right. who he was, of people crying, saying goodbye and hello and all this stuff at the airport. Anyway, I went over there and the first time I went over there, there was a bloke sitting there in a pinstripe suit surrounded by African chieftains. I said, oh, that's a good picture. And I took the picture. Suddenly a bloke comes up, grabs my shoulder and says, uh, I want to send that picture to my editor, give it to me. I'm with the Sunday Dispatch. So I take the film out, give it to him. And I rang up the picture editor at five o'clock and he said, well, I like all the pictures on here. He said, you've got a very good eye and I love this picture. He said, do you know it is? I said, no, he said, Rab Butler. And it was the, mm. you know, the British Foreign yeah. Secretary surrounded by these Africans. In, so uh, I suddenly had a, a, another string to my bow. But I have to tell everybody here that when I started photography, the first two years, which included a year on a national newspaper, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just looked through the and 50 lens. Years later, you stood yeah, up. and so, and there was a very nice guy at, at British Airways. Who, who took an interest in me, you know. Mm -hmm. And he forced me to look at pictures and he brought in photography annual, which was the big annual, you know, photographic annual at the time. And suddenly, I, you know, I started asking him questions about which lens took this and which camera did mm -hmm. that and everything. And I slowly, and I picked it all up. But I mean, it was all luck. You know, I'm the mm. luckiest guy in the world. Fantastic. So, I mean, the fact that you would sort of, I don't know, by accident, photographing uh, celebrities, uh, for ben w was there another direction you could have gone off into, whether it's reportage and or...? Well, no, I mean, I started doing reportage. Mm. I mean, I was, all the pictures I took of people at the airport were sort of reportage pictures. So I mean, why I did you veer more towards celebrity well, and...? this is, this is, I mean, I, because celebrity was at the beginning of its time, actually. I mean, you get, uh, Petula Clark's mm. in there having a coffee with curlers in their hair and mm -hmm. all that type of thing. And um, I mean, we were talking earlier that you know, obviously, when done your national service, you go away or whatever yeah. you go into, and then you come back, and then suddenly rock and roll's there, and the whole the whole world had changed. Well, yeah, no, it did change. I mean, then uh, then what I, I was doing this job for about three months on a Saturday, as well as working in British Airways mm -hmm. during the week. And suddenly a guy came and found me, he said, my name's Brian Fogarty, I'm, you know, and he was the like, top for Fleet Street guy. And he said, I'm meeting people like Sophia Loren and Nita Eggberg and all that, and they want me to come down to take pictures of on the film set. Mm -hmm. I mean, they used to ask photographers then down there, you know, mm -hmm. they're going to have to yeah, break doors down. Yeah, world, isn't it? Yeah, so, and he said, and I need someone to cover for me at the airport. So... I said, all right, you know, it's like, then I was down there for the whole week. Mm -hmm. Then he went to, uh, with the Aga Khan and his girlfriend, uh, no, not the, not the girlfriend, the girlfriend, they went together because mm -hmm. she was getting married to the Aga Khan right. and the plane crashed. Uh. And when I rang up the newspaper who I was working for, they said, would I like to take a job at the Daily Sketch? 
So suddenly there's me who doesn't know anything about anything. Except with a drumming. Job and the, yeah, yeah, except for drumming. Yeah. I mean, I still wanted to do that. Mm. I mean, that was my main thing. Mm. And the editor, he said to me, um, you know, I said, I don't know enough about it, Len, to take, you know, I, I just don't know. He said, don't worry, I'll look after you. Of course, I, I was 20, 21 then, mm -hmm. and I was the youngest photographer in Str Fleet Street by about 11, 12 years. The next guy was 31, 32. Right. So he was really taking a huge chance on kids. Mm -hmm. And I, what I realized was, I mean, r I was mostly being taken in to photograph pop groups mm -hmm. because they were just starting. Mm -hmm. And the, the assistant associate editor of the newspaper had a program called Cool for Cats. All oh, right. Ken, Ken, I forget what was it, Kerr Robertson, that was his name. And, they, and the first job I had, believe it or not, he said, look, we've got this group, they recorded down at Abbey Road, go down and do a, a shot of them. Well, I mean, that it's uh, easy now, but in those days, there weren't groups that, you know, everyone, there was Guy guys, Mitchell, yeah. Frankie Lane, mm -hmm. Rosemary Clooney, they're all single stars, but, th 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 you know, groups. So I go down there and there's this group and they're called the Beatles. So I do this sort of very amateurish shot of them with Ringo holding the thing. I mean, it is a funny shot. Anyway, they didn't publish it for three months. All so right. the record came out. The day they published it, the paper sold out and then they just went pop mad. And would you say that that was probably your first big break in terms of yeah, national well, exposure? Yeah, yes, in the newspaper. Mm. I mean, they didn't use it as, as a spread, and then they said to me, well, who, you know, you know music, who's the next group? Oh, right. And I said, well, I've been following this group called the Rolling Stones, they play down in Richmond, hmm. and they're, they're good little blues groups, so I go and photograph them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I take the pictures in, and they're horrified, they think they look like five prehistoric monsters so they said they, you can't use this you've got to find there must be a good looking group out there <laughs> and I, I just heard because you hear these things when you work on newspaper about a group being formed called the Dave Clark Five of which only one guy could play all the rest weren't really good musicians at all so I went and photographed them and then they ran the pictures as a double page spread of Beauty and the Beasts. Mm. And that was the start of mm. pop pictures in newspapers. And it's never looked back. And, that, and then suddenly, you know, I was going to this club called the Adlib Club and, you know, Bailey was there and Shrimpton and Stamp and Michael Caine and all these people. And we all became friends. And, Every, I mean, the great thing about the 60s was everyone wanted the young people to succeed. I mean, it was like a, an underground club I mean, because so we were all poor and, and, you know, nobody ever paid any attention to us. I mean, talking about that, and, and again, we, we talked about this earlier, and, and it just occurred to me that, you know, during the, that heyday, and you had obviously yourself and, and Bailey and uh, Litchfield and uh, Latigan and Duffy and Donovan, yeah. uh, and they're all Brits, uh, yeah. and they're all great photographers. You know, what was yeah. it about Team GB uh, photography in, in, in those days? That the main well, we were all success? friends, we all, all used to share. There was no sort of competition. Mm. You know, I mean, I knew my place for that. Because you I mean, were the youngest? Or? Well, no, I mean, I was, you know, I wanted to photograph them. That's who I was right. interested in doing. I mean, I went and photographed Bailey, yeah. photographing Shrimpton. She's all done up to the nines, and he's there in a vest, like Cuban eel boots, yeah, yeah. having a cheese roll for lunch. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the way it was, but they published the pictures. There yeah. was a great guy in the Express called Harold Keeble, who was very keen on young people to work for the paper. And he used to do some great photo news. You know, but was, the, was the there a then. sort of professional rivalry amongst you, or, or is you like you're good on well, you? Well, no, we were all in our own little group. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, I was photographing them, plus doing all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Bailey was Vogue, and mm -hmm. Duffy and Donovan was, a, you know, a mixture of them all. I mean, they all used to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a. But we were all friends, but not 
in each other's pockets. So fast forward like 10 years, and this is how far it's come. So you, you go off to LA, you go to the Oscars, you know, mid 70s, uh, you shoot one of the Oscar winners, uh, Faye Dunaway, and you end up marrying her. Uh, so how does that happen? And <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, I'm no super guy at all. Listen, we're all the same, oh, you know? know. <laughs> we're all the same, um, all from the same genes and all the rest of it. And uh, I, unfortunately, I am used to meet models or actresses. And you get that with the people My heart you, leads you. You work. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where I work. It's what can tough. I do? Yeah, tough life. I mean, I'd love to take out a doctor or something. But yeah, I mean, right. they, you didn't feel good enough for them. Because I know you've, you've created a lot, you know, you developed uh, really close friendships over the years with a lot of the people that you've shot. I mean, Michael Caine, uh, yeah. particularly, and Eric Clapton, uh, oh. Rackle Welsh. Is, um, obviously, you've got your favourite sitters because they're good friends yeah. of yours. Uh, are there those that were really difficult and that you'd rather not do again? Um, well, I, would, I wouldn't like to photograph Rackle Welsh. Oh, really? Again. Because, I mean, what happens with sex symbols is they, as they grow older, they take more and more time. I mean, she used to take an hour to get ready. Well, the last time I photographed, it was four hours. Oh, right. So you sort of get a bit jaded with it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're, they act just the same, except it's up for four hours more. So it's not very much fun. <laughs> so given the, you know, given the period that you've worked um, and uh, all the amazing stuff you've done and people that, uh, that you've shot, I mean, you've got you have got an amazing story to tell, but, uh, and I quote, um, you said the idea of writing your autobiography uh, disgusts you. Um, why, why is that? Why don't you spill the beans? Well, because I don't want to. I mean, you know, I've worked, I have worked, I've had an incredible life, I must admit, I can't deny that. And I've admired and liked all the people I photographed. But when you look at, there's flaws in everybody, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't want to get into that side. No. I just want to look at the people that I really admire and shoot and, and no, it's you know. Admirable res respect. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, because uh, I know you haven't been shooting a lot over the last uh, few few no. years, and you've effectively hung your, your cameras up for, for various reasons. Was that more because of the move from, from digital to film and, and well, that's that end one of that the era? Reasons. I can't be bothered with digital. Have you shot digital? Yeah, I shoot it now and then. Right. I mean, I d you know, you do it and everyone's looking at this bloody computer thing. <laughs> and then, computer thing. you know, they're supposed to be concentrating on doing the photographs. <laughs> and they're all looking at things saying, oh, that's good, that's good. I mean, it's not photography. It's like really weird. I mean, I, st <laughs> I just use film. I mean, I'm not no, I interested. Know. And I love getting the film back and finding great shots. Yeah, now that's the magic of I mean, I go to it? premieres, right? And there's all these guys taking pictures and they're saying the movie star, oh, hold it a minute. And they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> right, all right, one more. And then they, I mean, it's a joke. Yeah. I mean, photography's about moments, <clears throat> isn't it? It's not like. Have you seen the photographers that are tethered now? They've got links now back to. Oh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, no, on, on like ropes. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, bizarre. But. Um, so, um, there's one burning question that I'll, I'll end with before uh, I open it up to oh, our audience. <laughs> um, so, do you still play the drums? And were, no. you, were you any good? No, I was a really good drummer, you actually. Were. Yeah, I was. Were I mean, I started at, at nine. And oh, right. I, okay. I was 13 and a half when I started it in the London clubs. Well, I mean, that's something to be a, a, you know, it's only the intermission drum. I mean, what they had, they had an all-star group on, like Ronnie Scott Quintet, mm -hmm. right? Then they'd have Jimmy Ducci, who was a famous trumpeter, with the, what they call the resident rhythm section. Right. And I used to go with this rhythm section round at three London clubs. Fantastic. And I used to get a fiver. Uh, age 14? Yeah. yeah. Well, funnily enough, I mean, I always, even when I took up photography, I... I I ended up being the t highest paid photographer in Fleet Street. I got, I was on 75 quid a week. You still didn't know what you were doing. No, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I must say, I didn't. I, I, it, I, I've been so lucky and so fortunate. And I don't, when I look back, I wonder where it all came from. Yeah, fantastic. That's the right attitude. Right. Well, so I'm done for, for a while. So um, I'm done. I'll, I'll open it, open it up. Yes. That's not my picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's in a raffle, I understand, isn't it? Yeah. Gorgeous. 
But I have photographed Paul Newman. I've got some great pictures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you see these people, I interview them. I'm not a photographer, but I'm an interviewer. Yeah. Um, I mean, you see that Paul. Paul Newman is short. He's dumpy. He's not short and dumpy. He's a he's a great looking guy. <laughs> Do you want to capture all their faults as well on, on camera? Well, I don't see Paul Newman like that. You got the right Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was five foot nine, very slim. Well, that's the Paul Newman I know. I mean, I can't. Well, he, and the racing driver, he was very slim when, well, he, when was, he was probably shooting. I think he was probably drained. But when he's not shooting, he puts on weight. He's short waisted. He's chubby. <laughs> right. Well, I have not met that man. No, he was, he, he was probably the best looking guy I ever photographed. And the other good looking guy who you wouldn't realise was Elvis Presley, who had the most fantastic skin and all that. Fantastic looking guys. But the guy that I photographed, enjoyed photographing the most was Frank Sinatra. He was a different kettle of fish. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to say this. Um, something I wanted to say, I came today. This actually the reason I came here today. It's one of the important things. But when I was a kid, I had this picture on my room in, in a frame on my bedroom, and it's it, it's kind of led me into making films, and it's one of my favourite photographs of all time. And, I just wanted to ask you, because I know it's your photograph, how it came about, and it's... It's the Lee Marvin... The Lee Marvin Paul Newman yeah. photograph. Oh, right. Well, that, funnily enough, I got sent to Tucson, Arizona by 20th Century Fox to do the poster for the film. And I get on this film, right, and I've got two days to shoot this poster. And I walk on the film, and all the films round Paul Newman and all this and all the rest of it, standing over the other side who nobody's talking to and everyone hates is Lee Marvin. <laughs> so I went up to Paul Newman, I said, Paul, oh, I'm here to shoot the ad for the film and, and nobody will talk to Lee Marvin for me. He said, well, it's up to you. He said, okay. So I think I've got two days. So I walked straight over to him. I said, Mr. Marvin, he said, yeah. He said, I'm Terry O'Neill, I'm from London, I'm here to shoot the poster for the film. So he looks at me and he goes, are you English? I said, yes, well, English, Irish. He says, I love the English. And he shakes my hand. Well, I could feel the whole film set like, lifting up behind me, silently holding. So I said, well, I'm here to shoot the poster, would you mind coming over? So I took him straight away over to this wall and they lined up, and that was how I first met Paul Newman. Wow. And after that, funnily enough, I went on some other films with him. And for some reason, they thought I had some sway with him because he used to go out drinking lunchtime. He loved to drink tea. And they said, go and find him because you can look after him. But I'm, he's like six foot four, and I'm <laughs> down here somewhere. So, so I have to go there and he's always in and he's like provoking trouble and all the rest of it. It's him over here and a bunch of tough guys over there. It was hair raising, I tell you. But funnily enough, after a while I got to, when he was, gets very drunk, he mumbles and talks away. And he's actually talking about uh, deep sea fishing off the coast of <laughs> Australia. <laughs> and people think he's threatening to kill them and all the rest of it. It was really funny. But he was a great character. See, they don't make movie stars like that anymore. I mean, who's good today who's like it? Nobody. Jack Palance was another one. Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas. I mean, they're all John Wayne. I mean, they just don't make so movie Tom stars. Cruise doesn't cut it. No, not really. <laughs> Not just, really. Just one other thing on that specific photograph, because I, I graduated as a cinematographer, and that just the lights and the colours, the whites and the blacks really fascinate me. Right. Uh, they're so pure and uh, unique and specific. They were very, it can be graded, but you can't really change that photograph that no. much, which is a wonderful thing. A photograph you can't change. 
Did you use natural light? And yes, natural did light. Did you develop and process it? 35 mil, yeah, and I processed it myself, yeah. Were you using polys? No, just just straight D76 and all that. That's I mean, that was now my days of... Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, they don't use that anymore? Nah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, I, all that... I just had an instinct for light, you know, that's something people are born with or you don't realise, but you know, I realised it was a great situation. And I couldn't, you know, normally you look at that and you think it'd take years to set it up and do it and so on. It was all done in about 10 minutes. There's a lot of tension between the two of them. Was seeing yeah, I know, well there was, because he was, he'd fallen out with Paul Newman and that was like all daggers drawn. That was the first time anyone had ever got through to him on this film. <laughs> So I just took advantage of it and had a good time. And then through <laughs> Paul Newman, I met Clint Eastwood, who turned out to be a great guy as well. I mean, they're all great people, as you probably know. Thank you. Come on, we've got to have another question. Rick. Spend your time now, Terry, from Playing jazz music at home, going to the office, working with my mate Robin here, or going over to Getty. Uh, and sort of finding more pictures to sell, you know, that's what I do now. So, uh, and we put together shows, we got a show in Proud Gallery in Chelsea, if anyone wants to come to it, from next Wednesday for a couple of months. And the other ones you want me to go, they're too far away to go to. <laughs> but I travel all over the world doing shows, so I'm, I'm busier now, they're not, well, I'm not busier now I'm taking pictures, but it, it's a lot of work, what we do now. Do you still pick up the camera? No, not really. I hate. Do I tell you something honestly? People think I'm joking when I say this. I hate cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and I, if I didn't have to use them, it all happens up here, and it's all having to use something to do it annoys me, <laughs> or puts me off. I know it sounds weird, but I hate cameras. <laughs> so I, do, I never take a camera on holiday. I never. Once I've done it, I, it's at home, and that's it. Uh, no, well, the, the only person I would like to photograph properly was President Kennedy because I did him under his sort of news thing for, for a newspaper but I never got, I would have liked to have photographed him as a person. <clears throat> I mean they, you, you could get to those people in those days. I mean today's people don't really, I mean I admire their work but it's not, they're not like movie stars to me and they're not like great singers. I mean where's the new Dean Martin for example or the new Sinatra? There's none. They're all X Factor this and Biana and Rihanna and whoever. <laughs> <laughs> they are, but I mean they, have, they haven't got anything. Even there's no hardly any great jazz singers anymore. You, you know. gave up the opportunity of shooting Marilyn Monroe didn't you? As well. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah, this, uh, this is a funny story. Well, it's not so funny now, but it was at the time. <laughs> was I, when I first went to Hollywood, I met this woman called Pat Newcomb, who was, it turned out to be, I didn't know at the time, Marilyn Monroe's PR. So, uh, you know, she, everyone was after uh, to shoot Marilyn Monroe. And I, didn't, I had no desire to shoot Marilyn Monroe at all. I don't know why, she just didn't appeal to me. And uh, she and I remember this woman. She said, "I suppose you want to photograph Marilyn." I said, "I don't actually," and because I, I was after taking her out because she was a stunning. Stunning. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn was just an old slapper. Yeah, yeah, she was a slapper. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently she smelled. Bitter, so I mean, it's all cool. So anyway, she said to me, "She said to me, Every, she, you, I'm not going to let you photograph her because." she takes every photographer to bed. So that was that, actually. And I never got to take out this girl at the same time, so I was a double <laughs> loser. Double whammy. Yeah, double whammy. Yeah. Which of your photographs are you most proud of and why? Well, all the work <coughs> I did with Sinatra I liked. I loved the shot of Faye by the pool. I loved all, a lot of work I did with Audrey Hepburn, Raquel Welsh. But I haven't got a particular favourite. I mean, but sort of the biggest sellers of Bridget Bardot, uh, that Paul Newman, Lee Marvin, uh, Sinatra on the boardwalk, 
Because that's uh, an interesting story, how you, you got that gig as well, uh, Sinatra, because it was yeah. Ava Gardner that helped. Yeah, no, I, I, I was, sent, I was gonna, going to photograph Raquel Walsh in this film, and I knew Ava Gardner. I said, oh, I've got to go and photograph your ex-husband. She said, oh, I'll write you a letter. So she writes this letter, and I go on the set, and I've given the letter, and he says, right, you're with me. <laughs> and then I was, for the next three weeks, everywhere he went, I could go. I except for in the loo, but all the rest was... <laughs> I could go in the dressing room with him, go in here, sit in the room. I'd, it was unbelievable. I didn't realise, and it taught me how much somebody was still in love with somebody. It was He loved that woman, mm. you know, and he would do anything. And I, I was the lucky... See, luck again. Yeah, yeah. The lucky benefit <laughs> of... Uh, the luck of the Irish. Yeah, yeah. luck of the Irish, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I should be Irish. I was I was conceived in Ireland, born in Romford. <laughs> <coughs> that was my fate. And my parents had thick Irish accents, and of course I'd, I grew up with Cockney, which I'm glad about. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there any um, Mandela gigs that come about? Uh, a friend of mine worked for Nelson Mandela, and he came over here, and they wanted a photographer for his 90th birthday. So I got hired for a week to work with him. And I, and I must say, <coughs> out of all the people I photographed, that when he went, I nearly burst into tears because mm. I realised that I'd been with one of the greatest men of all time. I mean, it, what happened was, I, he lived in the Dorchester, and I used to get there at 9 o'clock when he got up. I sat in the room with him. I mean, Cameron came, Brown came, Oprah Winfrey came, Will Smith, Lewis Hamilton came. I mean, the whole world came up to see him. And I, I could see he was very frail. And uh, I, I thought, how's he going to talk to all these people every half an hour to somebody else? But he talked to them all day, and he, we sat and talked in between. I mean, he was an incredible man. And then all the people came who he was in prison with, and all part mm. of that part of his life. And I tell you, he was a man and a half. And it, it, when he left, he gave me a little wave like that, and I thought, oh, Christ, I nearly <laughs> cried. But I, it, it's, he stayed with me for a long time because I realised that this was truly a great man. He wasn't a politician or somebody. He was a great all-time sort of figurehead person in life. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. hi. Obviously, there's a lot of pictures of all these people individually, that picture you took of everyone, is it a Paramount? Mm. Yeah. How, how did you that organise that? Well that was, funny enough, I was working for Life magazine, they, were, they used to do an issue once a year on show business, and they said would I like to take these uh, Paramount 70th anniversary picture, I mean that was, I'll tell you something for people who, who think people are movie stars and untouchable and different to everyone else. <coughs> there was everybody there, Robert De Niro, Danny DeVito, Liz Taylor, Ch Charlton Heston, Burt Lancaster, everyone. And once we'd done the big group shot, we went inside to do special set up pictures, you know, whoever I could get together for pictures. And I noticed Elizabeth Taylor's missing. I'd known her for some time because I've worked with her a lot off and on over different pictures and so I went to look for her and I go in the corridor and she's out cowered in this corridor leaning up against the wall I said Elizabeth well I need you for some pictures she said I can't go in there she said there's all those stars in there she said they're all such big stars I said well like who she said Robert De Niro <laughs> and Harrison Ford, and, and I said, well, I said, you're a big star. Now, this is, she was, at the time, the biggest star in mm. Hollywood, but they just Bizarre. don't realise. That's why it's easier to go out with them, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tell you that, but that's, um, 
that's how it is. They don't. They've got no. They just sort of believe in every. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, and it's the publicists that build them yeah. up, isn't it? Yeah. And now the publicists rule everything. Mm. It's all now. I mean, mm. I'd hate to be a photographer there now. No, again, you know, going back to your, say the, the 60s and, and access was just so easy, whereas yeah, now Yeah, they it's, welcomed you. Yeah, yeah. Now they punch you in the face as soon as you <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did Daniel Craig the other day for Esquire, which Talking came punch Monday. Talking punching in the face, you're right. No, he's a very nice guy, actually. Because I did him for this Bond show. We, this is, we got this exhibition at Proud, and I, I, he was the only one I hadn't done. Right. I'm just uh, wondering if you could share some of your reflections when you when you look at magazines today and, and see celebrity photography today. I mean, it's a great difference, as you say. A lot of well, they're all retouched to death. I mean, they're all digitalized to death. I mean, I can't I can't think of a good magazine today. Is there, is there any really good magazine that you must get? Vanity Fair, maybe, mm. but that's gone off. You know, it's it's all had its day. I don't know what it needs change it they should bring back life magazine yeah. and all these magazines but if you look at the pictures themselves how would you say uh, celebrity photography has changed from your time well it's just not today. you can tell that people aren't close to them I mean it's like hello and all like, give me a break <laughs> <laughs> actually when I was in America in 1990 I lived in New York and uh, I saw this magazine called Ola, and I thought, thank God we haven't got this magazine in England. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd go back to England, and they'd bring it out as hello. And, and funnily enough, that was the beginning of the end of photojournalism. That one magazine brought the whole thing down. Now, I mean, I don't know what magazine you'll read, but I mean, you can't, what's there to read, let alone look at? I mean, what magazine do you look at? Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing, is there? Grants here, whatever they're all called. Okay, I mean. Yeah, I think I think some, you know, like Marie Claire, try to bring a sort of photojournalistic yeah. sense into it, um, as opposed to just a, a glossy. But yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Well, Robin, who used to edit the edit Sunday Times, started Spectrum, which was mm. the last sort of bastion of mm. good photography in magazines. Still, mm -hmm. those were the days. Yeah, mm -hmm. those were the days. Sure. Um, the image that you shot at Big Gunaway after Network Morning yep. um, it's, it's, it's an incredible image and it's, uh, it's very pulling you. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk about what led to that image and was it, was it, was it a bittersweet moment for despite winning the Oscar? Um, well, hopefully you can see all that in the picture. Yeah. I mean, what happened, I mean, all my life, I mean, what happened was I had an assignment from People magazine who used to follow the, the, to do the girl that they thought was going to win the Oscar and the magazine came out Monday and they, I mean if they were right they were right, if they were wrong they were wrong and I had this assignment to shoot Faye Dunaway and one of the ideas I've always noticed or wondered why I never saw a great picture of somebody with an Oscar, you only ever saw them holding it up and uh, I never saw anything that told a story and I knew from my experience that when an actress or an actor wins an Oscar, their money, I mean, she was on about four or five hundred grand a, a week on a movie, would immediately shoot up to a million or two million for a next picture because that's the picture that everyone supposedly wants to see, you know. So their money goes up and their life changes. Now, the night that they win it, they don't know what's hit them. They're all so excited and everything. But I did notice the people that I knew who did win Oscars, the next day became very introspective and they used to think about it and I wanted to capture it in this picture and of course I had fortunately in that picture I had the headlines of Peter Finch wins posthumous Oscar. I mean I had a lot of things going for me but what happened was she got up at 6.30, I got up at 5.30 and did this whole setup of her breakfast and all that by the pool in the Beverly Hills Hotel. Then I put her in there and I just watched her, you know, and she sort of made the picture herself. But I mean, I was proud of it. It's like one of the famous Hollywood pictures. It's not bad for an English folk to do that, is it? <laughs> <coughs> in their hometown. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, we live in a great country, guys. Anyway. The boost shop um, on the street. Yeah. How was that? Was that set up? That, believe it or not, I was in Tower Records. They, that he was looking into Tower Records, and behind him, across the street, behind that tree, because I, I did another picture with it. The, his album had just come out, Born Again. Was it Born Again? Born, 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 Born to Run. run. Yeah. And there was this big, pla you know, um, what's it called? Yeah, post. post thing. Yeah, billboard. Yeah, billboard. With, and I did him in front of it. But he was just walking along the street. I mean, he was nothing then, Bruce Springsteen. He was pleased to be. I could have asked him to stand on his head, he would have done. <laughs> <laughs> but he was such a charming man, a really nice guy. Just a pure yeah, yeah. I was coming out of Tower Records, and he was going in. Did you recognise him? Yeah. <laughs> but nobody really knew him then. I mean, it was incredible. So you mentioned Carter Bresson earlier. Are there were there other photographers that inspired you when when you were learning, as it were? No, the one who the one the one photographer that I really loved that I tried to base all my whole beginning was Eugene Smith. Oh right, okay. And I, I used to love the fact that one time he got ill and he never left his room and he photographed the whole of life in the street from his room for a year. He couldn't leave the room because he was sick. He went, he went mad, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. But he was a great photographer. <laughs> no, but I, he's the one I identified with. No, fantastic Nobody's story. Nobody's even heard of him. No, Eugene Smith, that whole story. I was yeah. in Boston, I think. Was, no, New York. I think. Oh, was it 120,000 shots or something? Yeah. He just kept taking out of the window, wouldn't yeah. even go out. Bizarre, I know. utterly bizarre. Yeah. That's a twofold question. It's, just, it's great to listen to you talk about um, you know, your beginnings and also you know, how your story developed. You've seen a lot during this whole period. Um, I just wanted to ask you just two things. Just interesting. You know, which of these errors? Did, did you enjoy photographing in the most 60s, 70s, the 80s? And also, I see that you've got a, a big catalogue of fashion as well as lifestyle and celebrity. Right. But which did you enjoy doing the most and why? Well, I, I wish I could say it was the 60s, but I didn't know what I was doing. So, <laughs> And also, I must tell you guys, that I used to go to the, this club, the Adlib Club, with the Beatles Stones and all the models and photographers and that, and we used to sit there talking about what job we're going to get when all this is over. Because we were all convinced this was a thing that was going to happen, and it was all going to come to an end and we'd have to go back and get a proper job. It was all like a dream. And it was only when I went to America when I was 24 and I met people like Fred Astaire and they used to ask me, what about the Beatles and the Stones and what are these people like? that I realised that, that, that it was for real. Mm. I mean, we honestly thought we were going to have to get a proper job. <laughs> You're still yeah, thinking that, yeah. No. And I, you know, I mean, you never did jobs for money or something. Mm. You're just pleased to have this life. Mm. I mean, it was an incredible life. I mean, oh, you'd absolutely. go in the office and I'd go and shoot Mary Quan. She invented this thing called the mini skirt. Mm. To, I mean, every day something happened. Mm. But, I mean, as I worked in it, I didn't really enjoy it. But I wish I could have those days back again. So I would have done a lot better pictures for a start. <laughs> so would you say the 70s was a much more enjoyable period because you yeah, know where you are Yeah, I was in then. control of it then. Yeah. Well, then I was like becoming a doyen and like when I came back to England, because I used to work in America a lot from the, from the 66 onwards, uh, they said, you know, we've had this, that and the other. And who's going to be the next big pop star? And uh, funny enough, I'd heard this record on the radio, and it was uh, uh, called Take Me to the Parlour. And I said, this, uh, I'll find out who this is, because this kid's going to be really big. He's American, but I'll find out. Anyway, I go into it. turns out he's English, and his real name's Reg Dwight. All right, and yeah. it's Elton John. And I, I sort of said, I found out, I told this newspaper, asked me to find out who it was. So I found, I go and make an appointment to shoot him. I take the picture, they said, you can't publish him, he's got glasses, he's <laughs> losing his hair. And I said, well, that's the way he is. I said, he's a great singer. And of course, the only, po funny enough, Vogue were the only people who published the picture of him. I did him with a ring, it was like, you know, it was a fabulous ring. And uh, that was the start. 
I mean, I had a great time with him. He was a great guy to work with. I mean, he is had tantrums and all that. But it never happened with me. And uh, he was really a nice guy. And um, Tom Jones was another one. He, I had a great time with him. I mean, I've had the best time. But honestly, when I sit, I mean, I, I realise when I come and talk to people what a great life I've had. I have. So I can't make any excuses for that. So just going back to the gentleman's question, oh. so was it, you know, celebrity lifestyle, fashion, was it celebrity that you really enjoyed? Well, I mean, I, it just, that's a world I got to know. You know, the guy, that when I started, they sent me to do the Beatles, because I did that well. They, I got sent to do people like Laurence Olivier and all that. And I just got on with the people. I mean, I used to cover crime stories, I knew there was a book about how to save people swimming or how to swim this way right. or that way. I mean, you, in those days on a newspaper, you used to use, do six or seven jobs a day. You know, all different mm. jobs. Mm. I mean, to, to, I think they do a job a day, don't they, Rob? Don't do any. Don't do any, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. It's true. So were there any, so were there any uh, real disasters in terms of shooting? Only so one. Only one thing ever that has ever gone wrong for me was Peter Sellers was a mate of mine and he was getting married <coughs> and he married uh, Brett Eklund. He says, he said, I can't give it to you exclusive. He said, but come round the back of the garden. He said, they'll all be out the front. I'll do some exclusive pictures with you, with her, you know, giving her a kiss and all this. <coughs> so I go around the back of the garden, think, walk past all the blokes, go back to London, take the camera into the dark room and open the camera I've got no film in it oh. <laughs> and that's I never ever made that mistake again <laughs> never I mean and believe it or not the, the, he got married down there Guildford I had to go back all the way back down there and explain it to him I mean it was uh, the <laughs> but he found that funny though he they, oh done. no he did he yeah. thought it was funny <laughs> I was falling down through fatigue <laughs> You hear about um, people saying that the camera loved them. Is there anyone that surprised you that you took pictures of them and you didn't really see what it was until you actually? Well, uh, I do, you learn pretty early that light is the key to it all, yeah. and people have got a certain bone structure, although they may not look great in real life, photograph great. It's just a thing of light, you know. But I mean, someone like Paul Newman is as good looking as he looks in the movies. And Elvis Presley was a great looking guy. John Wayne was John Wayne. Robert Mitchum, he was another great guy. See, they don't make these guys anymore. <laughs> There's a recurring theme here. Yeah. Right? It's true, though. I mean, can you. Very pretty, but... No, I know, but they were guys, weren't they? They were yeah. proper guys. <laughs> I mean, all the movie stars look the same today. They always wear black suits, this, that. They're all dressed by the same people. I mean, it's weird. Like miserable old gear, aren't yeah. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. yeah. This is just one other thing. We've yeah. a lot about your professional um, capacity and your, your your professional life. But did the work and this consistent work and obviously the success did it affect your your personal life? How did it affect your personal life? And, and well, if you, if it you broke. Could tell us if, uh, if you could tell us the names of any more. Actresses or actresses. <laughs> 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 no, really, listen, it broke up my first marriage. I mean, I used to have to go to America three months at a time. And <clears throat> I'll never forget. I mean, it's one thing in my life I'll never forget is that when I had to walk out of my house and my wife and two kids were there. I don't know how I did it. <clears throat> and of course, I went after a year, I went back and, you know, that. I mean, I regret that a lot. That, and uh, marriage with Faye Dunaway was a nightmare. But I have got a very good wife now, so I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> One out of three, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> she could be a killer, for all I know. <laughs> uh, Careful what you say, you're on camera. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? Rick. Yeah, I'm gonna one thing that strikes me about you is that you're really down to earth. You know, you become a celebrity in your own right, but you still seem to be incredibly down to earth. And I'm, I'm from the East End as well, so I'm thinking there's hope from yet. But <laughs> <laughs> is that something that you've deliberately done? And I'd also like to say that 
Um, was he really? <laughs> Good Lord. He was a, you know, I, I felt sorry for Pete. He was an unhappy mm. man. Yeah. A lot of the time. And he, he just couldn't under, he had a brilliant mind. Great man. Uh, I forgot what the question was now. Oh, <laughs> because uh, I, it, it, listen, when you've been around the egos I've been around, you, you're quite happy to be nobody. I <laughs> uh, believe me. I'll be, I mean, yeah, so there's a lesson for you, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can be just as happy, happier. I mean, I wouldn't, I'd hate to be really well known. Well, I hate it. You know, you, you, I mean, I travel on the bus a lot because I've got a bus pass now. So <laughs> it's easier, cheaper for me to get on a bus. But if somebody, if Frank Sinatra got on the bus, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just, they haven't got a life. And when you're not known, it's fine. Hence the lack of autobiography. Yes, yeah. uh, plus, yes. So we've got a couple of minutes. Um, he's got to get home to his cocoa. And, uh, yeah. There's a <laughs> buses outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last couple of questions. Anyway. You talk fondly about the days back in the 60s where everyone was friends. Now, are there any friendships that have lasted all the way through? Well, Michael Caine, I still know. Terry Stamp. Bailey. I mean, there are some left, you know. They haven't all popped off, but they are popping off regularly. I mean, there's a great friend of mine called Peter Evans, who you wouldn't know, who used to be a show business writer on the Express. He just died, heart attack, just boom. He's, he's writing this book on Ava Garden, and he's on the latest, last chapter. And he got up, hit the wall, it was in terrible pain, and just dropped dead. I mean, it just happens. I mean, there's no fun in getting older as well, that's the other thing. <coughs> so you should appreciate every day we are here. It's, uh, it's, um... So is Bailey as miserable as, as people say? Yeah, I t he's, he's, he's a funny guy. Because <laughs> I know Bailey and Duffy were really good mates as yeah. well, but again, that was the yeah. miserable well, old Did you club. see that program? Yeah, they the, made the, oh, oh, fantastic. It's it's like both Victor Meldrews in, in yeah. the movie. You mean like giving classes? Yeah, or like class classes or well, like that, yeah. I have thought about Private. it. Yeah, I mean, you can't talk about a picture. You can talk about how to take pictures and all that, but you can't talk a picture. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can only tell people what makes a picture. You know, you can't talk and a picture will appear. You can talk about it's, it is about moments of life, and it, it, if you understand that, what I'm saying is you obviously do, you'll understand, you know, I mean, I could think that, you know, show a whole load of pictures and say, oh, I did this, doing that, and that, which would help people, you know, because it, it's all confidence, really, you know. I mean, I don't know where I got mine from, but I, <laughs> I was actually, I mean, there was one time when I left the Daily Sketch, I, I said, because I, I was sick to death of going somewhere, because it was all taken, no give, you know, you go and do poor people get thrown out of a house, and you say, well, what about following this story up and say, that's yesterday's news, concentrate on today's. Anyway, I, get, I ended up going to ch um, cover this children's funeral in Croydon. And I could, couldn't take a picture because it, it was horrible. There's about 118 kids dead. And uh, I went back to the thing. I said to Len Frank, who was the picture editor, uh, I can't do this job anymore, Len, I'm going to go. And he said, well, if that's, he said, you better go and tell the editor. So I had to go up to the editor's office and all that to go. And he's got this big bloody moustache. And he says, the moment you walk out of O'Neill, you're finished. He said, this paper's made you and you'll be nothing without it. 
and that put the fear of God in me. I mean, that was the worst thing you could say to me. And I just got, I left, and I, I just rang on the phone every single contact I had. And within a week, I was happy as a sandboy again because I was getting published somewhere, you know, and all that. It's funny. And, but the funny thing was that all these pictures I took, I didn't care a damn about the negatives. I mean, it's only by <coughs> luck if I found a lot of the pictures that I've got. It's all luck. I mean, nobody cared about negatives. You just did the job. You just left them in the dark room or something. I mean, nobody really cared about them. Except Getty, yeah. of course. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice thing, though. Who's got the biggest collection going? But, I mean, yeah, it is thanks to, to people like Robin that, you know, to, to almost recreate the archive and, and going yeah. to, you know, Vogue and, you know, all these places. Them, to, yeah. yeah, to try and, you know, recreate uh, the archive, which, you know, uh, Duffy, I think, did as well. It's yeah. the same sort of thing, so... It was. St I remember when we uh, came out <laughs> to your place to pick the stuff up. It was everywhere, under beds, in yeah, on shelves. And, 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 I mean, and they're still finding stuff months later. So, uh, but we tidied it all up. Yeah, so. Yes. So right. On that note, on uh, that unless note. anyone's got one more, then uh, I think all I can say is thank you so much. Terry. All right, mate. Thank it's you. Absolute pleasure. <laughs>